Okay, happy uh, Sunday morning uh, to all of you. Glad to have you joining us for Sunday School this morning on this happy October Sunday morning. Been some nice weather the last couple days. It was nice to get that change from the heat we've had before. Kind of hoping the smoke completely clears up and doesn't come back with a vengeance like it seems to have done a couple times where you, just the time you thought it's clearing and then you get all kinds of smoke again. Um, but um, I don't know about you, but I've been enjoying the weather like I think many of our Hollister houses, we don't have air conditioning. And so I've just noted the last uh, few days, uh, without having to really open the windows all that much, our house has stayed between 68 and 72. Um, so that's been nice. Uh, but it's going to be a, a privilege for us to join together this morning uh, for the study of the Word of God. And so we're going to do that in just a moment. I'm just taking a quick look in our bulletin. And our missionaries of the week are the Darlins. Uh, serving there in Hong Kong. So let's be uh, in prayer for them. Uh, they, uh, here in our bulletin, as mentioned, a prayer request regarding a third wave of the coronavirus infections uh, there. And so they um, says that national security law um, has done some restrictions. And so, all right. So let's be in prayer for them. Um, there's different medical restrictions. And then they talk about renovation to their facility where their church meets. Uh, it's been six months since they were able to uh, worship publicly, and they, they say, though, the Lord has shown himself gracious. So let's pray for that church. Um, the Darlins are missionaries, and they're ministering in a church there in Hong Kong, and they have a congregation and a flock that has not been able to meet together in person. Uh, we can understand that. We've not been able to uh, do that indoors, um, but thankfully, later this morning, when we have our morning worship service, we'll be able to have uh, worship service outdoors uh, together. I um, personally, I'm, I'm encouraged when we can meet together as a local body of believers and encourage each other along those lines. All right, so we're going to pray for the uh, Darlings this morning, and uh, let's go ahead and also pray for a couple other prayer requests in here. Uh, Jennifer Fisher has an unspoken uh, prayer request. I also have an unspoken prayer request, and uh, let's uh, be in prayer for that, and then uh, we also have here pray that the numbers uh, continue to fall in our county as far as COVID-19 cases go. And um, so let's go ahead and open our Sunday school time in prayer. Dear God, we ask your blessing on our time of gathering together around your word and pray that uh, the study of your word would be encouraging to us this morning, would help us. Uh, may each of us be helped in the way that we need this morning and the way that you desire. May you accomplish what you want to through this lesson. We thank you for your word and the guidance it gives us. We pray for the Darlins and the Christians that they are ministering to in Hong Kong. We pray your blessing on them and pray for them as well as us in the difficulties uh, surrounding COVID-19. Pray for um, your church to be effective uh, regardless of these types of circumstances. May we, um, both our congregations, be carrying out uh, the Great Commission. May we be edifying one another. May we be glorifying you. Uh, even this morning as we have church services here, may we glorify you in all these things. We uh, pray that you would be with Jennifer Fisher's unspoken request and uh, mine as well. Lord, you know the needs on the heart of both her and I. Pray that you would meet these needs and we lift them up before you. And we ask your blessing now on our Sunday school time. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to continue our study in the book of Romans. Uh, in recent lessons, we've um, uh, gone over the doctrine of salvation, the gospel. Um, so we've talked uh, some about God's plan of salvation and how he uh, plans on saving us and even uh, being secure in that salvation. Uh, today we're looking at lesson five, how God sanctifies us. And here's an, kind of an introduction uh, maybe by way of transition, reading from a uh, commentator. He says this, Having told us that we have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, and that would be in the, the previous chapters that we've just looked at, the apostle raises a natural question. So this is at the start of chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at all of chapter 6 today. But here's this natural question that seems to arise um, amongst people. If this is so, that this idea that we can become Christians, that we can have God's gift of salvation, if that's true, if a believer is eternally secure, secure 
as in we can have assurance of that salvation. That assurance totally rests on God himself. Does God know what he's talking about? Does he keep his word? If this is the case, that we can be eternally secure in our salvation, does that mean that the Christian can do as he likes? Get away with sin, live to please himself. To which Paul responds with a resounding, God forbid, uh, there in the start of chapter 6. So here's the question that um, you know, uh, comes up at the start that we'll get to in just a moment. Um, is this idea. If we're Christians and we know we're going to go to heaven, and that's for sure, hey, I wonder, can I do anything I want? Uh, can I sin? Uh, would that be a good thing? If I sin a lot, does that give God lots of opportunity to forgive me? And it's not just a hypothetical question on Paul's part. Uh, he had concern himself with his own uh, followers, the, those who uh, he had an influence in converting to Christianity. Um, and Paul says in Romans 3, 8, that there were some that were reporting that Paul was even teaching this, um, that he had been teaching, let us do, this is, uh, by the way, Romans 3, 8, let us do evil that good may come. And some were, as Paul put it, they were slanderously reporting that he was teaching this. But there were some that were teaching this. And again, so this is not just a hypothetical question. There were those in his day that were teaching this. Some were reporting Paul was teaching this, and there were some of his followers that had adopted this philosophy. Uh, perhaps they had been influenced by these other teachers that were teaching this false teaching. As an example of this not being just simply a hypothetical question, I'll uh, quote from one Bible commentator who mentions an example, and here's what he says. A notable historical instance may be seen in the Russian monk Rasputin, uh, who was the evil genius of the Romanov family in its last years of power. Rasputin taught and exemplified the doctrine of salvation through repeated experiences of sin and repentance. He held that as those who sin uh, most, that those who sin most uh, require forgiveness, a sinner who continues to sin with abandon enjoys each time he repents more of God's forgiving grace than any ordinary sinner. Some of Paul's own converts gave him much cause for concern on this very score. It was bad enough to have his theological opponents misrepresenting his gospel as being tantamount to, quote, let us do evil that good may come. That's the Romans 3, 8 verse. It was worse when his converts played into their hands by behaving uh, as though the gospel gave them license to do whatever they liked. So what we're going to be taking a look at today is kind of the answer to this very topic. You know, we, um, just by way, again, by way of introduction... Let me just read a few verses that kind of get our minds going this direction. Uh, one, uh, several from the book of Romans that come later in the chapter, and then a couple from the book of James. Uh, book of Romans chapter 8, 29 tells us that it's our destiny as Christians to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us a little bit more about that. Of course, we're going to get to these later in our book of Romans study. But if we're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus, we're going to become like Jesus, which is what the word Christian literally means. It means like a little Christ, a Christian, uh, someone who looks like Christ, like a little uh, version of him. Romans 12, 1 and 2, that, um, an aspect of that is presenting our bodies to God as a living sacrifice, that we are giving ourselves to God. And it says in that next word, holy, holy. Now that's a word we'll come back to, but the title of today's lesson uh, use, uh, has in the title sanctify, sanctification, the idea of making one holy. So we're going to wrap up today's discussion by coming back to the word sanctification and thinking about that word more, but it's the idea of becoming holy. Romans 12, 1 uh, tells us that uh, we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice to God that is holy, that is sanctified, acceptable unto God, it says. And it says it's our reasonable service. Verse 2, not to, that we're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed. So we're to be like Jesus. And James, the, the Apostle James, tells us in the book of James that our Christian faith 
if it's not accompanied by works that would, as, as is uh, said by Paul elsewhere, works that are meet or fit for repentance, that we've had a change, we've repented, we've turned uh, from our former lifestyle. He says, faith without works is dead, being alone, James 2.17. And James says, if a man says he has faith, and James says, I have works, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And he's teaching there that when a Christian truly has uh, a faith in God, that there's going to be works that demonstrate that and that illustrate that. So now let's go to our first section in chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, uh, where we'll continue some of these thoughts. Uh, Shall we sin to the glory of God? And we read here in chapter 6, verse 2, the answer to that. God forbid. Okay. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 1, God forbid. Shall we continue to do wrong so that the grace of God that imparts his help to forgive that sin, that he can do that again and again? Would it be like this? I've, I continue to sin because praise God, he forgives me. And I get to glorify him through my sin uh, because it gives him opportunity to forgive it. Uh, it's, it's such a foreign thought to any that understand Uh, the whole nature of the gospel and what it means for a person to be changed. The Bible uh, tells us, and I don't remember the verse, I believe it's in one of the books of Corinthians, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things become new. But uh, there are some here, apparently, verse 1, they thought, we can not be changed, we can continue in sin, and that's going to be a good thing, because grace will abound. Now, Paul uses the phrase, God forbid, Um, That's a phrase that comes from two Greek words. Interesting enough, neither of the words is the word for God. So you don't find the word God in that. Um, One of the words means to become, to come to pass or to happen, while the other means not. So therefore, the, the two words, if you put them together, Paul is saying, may it never happen. May it never be so. Um, let that never be the case, uh, that we would act this way, that we think we can sin so that God has an opportunity for his grace to abound. Uh, here are, uh, by the way, let me, I'll get off on a little side uh, note on this. Um, when you translate from one language to another, inevitably, um, you can't always translate word for word literal. And so, Now, in this particular case, um, I suppose you could uh, perhaps uh, describe this particular phrase almost like a dynamic equivalence. Uh, That is, it's equivalent or basically uh, equivalent to the thought, but not necessarily a literal equivalence. Uh, Many translations of the scriptures on this point um, do translate it a little bit more literally. than it happens to be that the King James does, which is what I read out of, which uses the phrase, God forbid. Um, But it has the same meaning. So now I didn't research this. Well, I researched a little bit and I didn't find immediately the answer. So I I didn't uh, deem it worthy of a lot of time uh, to research further. Uh, But so I'm, I'm kind of imagining here. I'm imagining that in the day and age in which the King James was translated back in the 1600s, that in English to say God forbid was a common phrase that says should never happen. No way, that should never happen. Um, In fact, that was the way it was translated in the Wycliffe Bible. Uh, Wycliffe translated his Bible in the 1300s. Uh, It's the first English translation of uh, the Bible. And then uh, the Geneva Bible, which was a uh, very well-known version, and the Geneva Bible was used by a lot of the Puritans in uh, the colonial days of our country. It was a very popular Bible uh, in that day. Um, you have both the Wycliffe Bible, the Geneva Bible, and the King James Version, all, tr- all using that phrase, God forbid. And they're all in English translations. And so I'm just imagining during that time period, that was a common way of saying, no way. God forbid that that ever happened. No way. Um, Here are some other ways that uh, other English translations mention it. Uh, Here's uh, one, the New International Version. 
by no means. Um, the several other versions, absolutely not. That's unthinkable. Far be the thought. Uh, let the thought be abhorred. Now that's not a, a version, but that's Matthew Henry's commentary where he uh, describes it that way. Let the thought be abhorred. I should hope not, is another uh, translation. So they all have that idea. I like uh, Matthew Henry's there, uh, may that thought be abhorred, uh, because uh, the idea behind this, in fact, uh, another commentary, um, the pulpit commentary, which was a common commentary series, I understand, uh, that many pastors used uh, for many years, um, it describes this phrase as Paul's usual way of rejecting an idea indignantly. So I think Matthew Henry's uh, description of it, let, not just let the thought be rejected, let it be abhorred. That's, that's a repugnant thought. And again, Paul says this elsewhere in the scriptures when he used, when, uh, if, I, if you happen to be reading out the King James or the Wycliffe or the Geneva Bible, uh, uses that phrase, God forbid, it's an abhorrent thought, uh, totally unacceptable. So as we read further on this, we read a little bit about what we should know. Uh, looking at verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might not be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And so there's some things that we need to know. Okay, for one, we know that that's an abhorrent thought. We aren't to go around sinning so that God can have an opportunity to forgive us and show his grace. God forbid that. Here's what you need to know. And there's several, a uh, couple things, main points you see on the slide there that we need to know. We are dead to sin, and we are aw alive to walk in newness of life. And so, um, this idea of being baptized into Jesus comes up in verse 3, and it's an interesting thought that I think portrays this uh, idea of being dead to sin, and this idea of, as I put on the slide here, uh, uh, that we are alive to walk in newness of life. Now, I actually borrowed a little bit a phrase that I uh, remember hearing frequently since I uh, grew up attending this church. So uh, former pastors in our church frequently, when uh, behind the stage here, we have the, the baptismal up here. And I just remember the pastor being up here and... Um, as he baptized, would often say this, and I don't remember which pastor said it, I don't remember if every pastor said it, I just remember the phrase, buried with him in baptism as he dipped the person into the water, raised to walk in newness of life. So this idea of baptism is that. And of course, um, that's, I think, why the um, baptism by immersion is, is the best picture of what baptism is about, that one is baptized into Christ, buried with him in the baptismal waters, and then raised to walk in newness of life. Of course, baptism itself is a public testimony of that, and um, one in which these scriptures tell us would be something that a person would do when they give a public testimony that they have received Christ. And so believer's baptism is somehow uh, sometimes... Uh, how we word that. Okay? Uh, but here in this passage, uh, we are seeing this uh, illustration in regards uh, to our own uh, behavior, what, what we should know is true about us. Galatians 3, 7 says this, As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. One commentator says uh, this in regards to this first, uh, have been incorporated into him have become members of his body. And so verse 3 tells us that um, as so many of uh, that, sorry, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And the idea behind this is what we died to. 
there was a death to sin, and so then there's going to be a raising to something different. And so in verse 4, we were buried with him by baptism into death, and verse 4 continues that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in this newness of life. And so there's going to be something different. We, um, we read on further, now that we are in this newness of life, we, are, we not only have just been baptized, uh, and, and I don't want us to think just strictly of um, the actual baptism that might take place in actual waters, um, but that we bap baptized into life in Christ. And so Christ brings life. And what does that life bring? Verse 5 uh, we've been planted together and still carrying this idea of new life, like a plant that you would plant, and it's alive and growing. And we've been planted together. We not only have been planted into Christ in the likeness of the fact that we have a death to sin, but we've also um, are planted with him in the likeness of his resurrection. And so what does that result in, verse 6? Um, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might not be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And verse 7 tells us that we are freed from the power of sin. And so we have the, this opportunity to be dead to sin, but alive to Christ. And these, um, ah, okay. I was looking for verse 7, and it printed it on the top of the other page. It's like, where did it go? Yeah, there it is. For he that is dead is freed from sin. All right, uh, so continuing on in our study here then, if we are dead to sin, let's, uh, let's look a little bit more about what this frees us to do now that we have new life in Christ. Uh, this will be us looking at verses 8 through 14. Verse 8, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. And so it's, uh, we're, we've been freed from sin. And the idea of dominion, it's no longer going to exist. Sin does not rule over us. Uh, in that he died, verse 10, he died unto sin once. But in that he lives, he lives unto God. And so we're going to see this and develop this more in just a little bit when we get to verses uh, 15 to 23. But you can kind of uh, already see the picture developing now, this picture of kind of a, a slave-master uh, relationship. Uh, or as uh, one commentator puts it, and I'm, like I said, it's down the road. What did he call it? Yeah, if I could find it. It's a... All right, my eyes are not falling on it quickly. And so we'll come back to that. But it's like a slave-master relationship that we have. And so dying to sin, that was our old slave, and Jesus now, our old master, I should say, and Jesus becomes our new master. And in so doing, there's things that you don't have to do with the old master anymore. And we see in verse 9, Christ being raised from the dead, um, we have no more death. Death does not have dominion over us. Okay? And so we are free to serve God because sin is dead and its consequences, which is the death that is there. Uh, verse 10, for in, him that, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, verse 11, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have this idea of reckoning. So Paul said um, in the first seven verses, we saw the word no come up. Know this. Here's some truths you need to be aware of. And now you need to reckon this. You need to think this way. You need to have these thoughts in your mind. What is this thought? Consider yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. So Paul's saying, let's have that thought in our mind. Let's be getting our thinking changed. You need to know some truths. Now have this thought in your mind. You are dead to sin. You do not have to serve it anymore. You are alive to God. So therefore, we see that word in verse 12, let not sin therefore, because of this, reign in your mortal body. You don't have to obey sin. It's not your master anymore. Um, so because that's true, you don't have to obey that. 
Now, I'm a principal uh, here at our Christian school, and uh, one of the things I have to sometimes help our students with is to know that you, will, you need to obey your teacher, but sometimes we have people around here called teacher's aides, helpers, and I will let the students know this. You have to obey them. I realize they're not your teacher, but you are to obey them as well. Because sometimes the students will get in their mind, well, they're not really a teacher, so I don't really have to listen to them. I only have to listen to my teacher. And so we try to clear that up right at the start that they have any idea in their mind uh, that that would be the case. But, you know, truthfully, there are some people those students don't have to listen to. I remember once having to approach one of our parents the parent was reprimanding one of the students. They, they came uh, before three o'clock, they pulled into our parking lot. Uh, we're here a little bit early to pick up their child and um, we were doing PE on the, this end of the parking lot where the basketball courts were. And they, they addressed one of the students and reprimanded them for something. And I had to talk with them on the side and ask them not to do that because they really have no authority over the children of other parents. Now I do as a principal because parents have hired us to watch their kids, to, to supervise them as well as educate them. And so parents have granted us authority over their children, but the parents have not granted authority to the other parents. And so I couldn't have another parent stepping in and trying to uh, you know, correct something or, or deal with a situation. And, you know, so uh, even we have everyday examples where we realize some people we should obey or we should follow and other people we don't have to listen to. And that is true here, that, that example is true of sin. Christians, we don't have to listen to sin. We don't have to do what sin would want us to do. We don't have to give in to that. We should uh, be living for God and listening to Him. And so verse 13 tells us, neither yield ye your members, your, your body, yourself. Your, your members are like body parts. You know, but uh, we're not talking about anatomy here. We're talking about don't yield your body as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Unrighteousness, uh, the root word there always helps us remember what the word means, has to do with right. Unrighteous is not doing what's right. So don't yield yourself, your, your, yourself as an instrument of doing wrong that is unto sin. Rather, yield yourself, submit yourself to God as those that are alive from the dead. That baptism into Christ, raising to walk in newness of life. We're alive from the dead. We're dead to sin. And, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Let's live that way. And so we have this idea uh, that we, by God's grace, can live for God. And that word grace is the ending of this section. Verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you, because you are not under the law of sin. You are under grace. God can help us to live this way. And so... Let's be encouraged to reckon ourselves. Let's get that idea in our head that that's what life is, is like as a Christian. And then going to our uh, next slide, looking at um, verses 15 through 23, continuing this thought that you are a servant of God. Now here's the deal. You serve what you yield to. So we were already told to submit ourselves let me go back and remind myself the wording. Yield, yield yourselves. Okay, um, it says there in verse 13. Well, you serve what you yield to, we're told here. Uh, let's read starting in verse 15. What then? Okay, what then? Because of this, because reckoning yourselves, what then? Okay, looking back at that original question, should we continue in sin? What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? Paul repeats that phrase, God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey? Okay. Well, this is a truth. The, the fact is that 
we're going to be servants one way or the other. Um, it's, a, it's a fallacy of thinking when people think that they can control their sin. Some people want to say, I want the freedom to do whatever I want. You don't really have freedom. Uh, the scriptures tell us that when the Son makes a person free, the Son of God makes a person free, they shall be free indeed. Uh, people th uh, talk about freedom, but the fact is that sin controls us and sin motivates us. And oftentimes we end up doing things that we're ashamed of or wished we didn't do. And so verse 16 tells us that, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey. And now here's this two options he's talking about, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. And so we have these two options. Who do we want to be slaves of? Who do we want to be the servants of? Sin or righteousness? Sin or God? Verse 17, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And we see in these verses what led to this. Well, we have this uh, doctrine, this form of doctrine was delivered to you. They understood that the word doctrine just means teachings. The teachings on the gospel. They became Christians. And they obeyed that form of doctrine from their heart. And so then they were freed from sin, become that, and they became servants of righteousness. Okay? Um, verse... 19 I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh I'm just going to go ahead and read to verse 23 and then come back and comment on several things um, Continuing in verse 19 for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity Even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness For when you were the servants of sin you were free from righteousness but what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye were now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. Well, um, I... Uh, by the way, earlier when I was trying to come across that phrase the commentator used, I just came across it, a slave market example. And let me actually read uh, a little bit of what he says on that idea of what we're looking at in this passage. Uh, this commentator says, Paul then uses the analogy of the slave market to illustrate his point. A slave is bound to obey his master, but there is a point beyond which his master has no authority over him and that point is death. When the slave is dead, his master can go on giving orders to the corpse until he is blue in the face, but the corpse will pay no attention. Or to put it another way, a slave's former owner has no more authority over him if he becomes someone else's property. That is what happened to you. You have passed from the service of sin into the service of God, your business now is to do what God desires, not what sin dictates. There is a big difference between uh, the kind of thing you will do as servants of God and the kind of thing you used to do as servants of sin. And not only is there a difference in character between the two kinds of service, there is a great difference between the ends of these services. And let's take a look at that. We see that on our PowerPoint slide where it says... Sin produces uncleanness and death. Righteousness produces holiness and life. And so what that commentator was referring to is there's a big difference between the two. We read that sin produces the fruits of uncleanness. Uh, it says also iniquity. We read about that in verse 19 where it says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Okay, that, that we, as we serve sin, what we end up having happen is uncleanness 
and iniquity or sin that results in more sin. That's the result of giving in or yielding to a, uh, the temptation to sin. Um, we also see that the end result of this is death, and we read about that in verse 21 and 23. Now, uh, previously I've uh, shared uh, some handouts, some sheets of paper uh, that have uh, what we might call the Romans road to salvation and some key verses from the book of Romans. Romans 3.23 would be a great one to memorize for that. It says there, for the wages of sin is death. What we earn is death. When you live death, when you live sin and you submit to sin, that is the end result of it. The end result of being death. And so righteousness, though, produces something different. We read that also in verse 19 and then in verse 22. At the end of verse 19, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness. And what does that result in? Unto holiness. Okay? Uh, the concept of holiness is the concept of being set apart. Set apart from something which is not holy. Set apart, often in a special way, for a special reason. Often separated, the, the idea of holiness does involve a separation. Separated from that which would make it unholy. And uh, we read again here in verses 19 and 22. Even so now, yield your members, submit yourselves as servants to righteousness unto holiness and that's uh, one of the benefits or the results and in verse 22 but now being made free from sin become and become servants to god you have your fruit you know fruit of course is what uh, a plant produces uh, that you know when you plant an apple tree what you're hoping for is the fruits of that tree it's what you get out of it what do you get out of submitting yourself to god verse 22 uh, when you become the servant of God, you have your fruit unto holiness. That's what God is going to produce in a life that submits to God and serves him. And though the end, there's another benefit, and it's really the final end benefit. The end, everlasting life. And then verse 23, again, which would be a great verse for us to memorize. It could be uh, instrumental in, uh, in witnessing and having it there if you ever talk to someone. The wages of sin is death. That's what you earn. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now in this section, it does also imply that you cannot serve both of them at the same time. Um, we get this in verses 16 through 18, 20 and 22. Uh, we don't have the ability to serve both. Okay, whichever you yield yourself to, that's what uh, is going to be produced. Uh, you can't yield yourself to sin, which is going to produce unrighteousness, and at the very same time, yield yourself to God, which is going to produce righteousness. Righteousness and unrighteousness are mutually exclusive. They, they, it's like trying to have a room be pitch black and bright with light at the same time. They just don't go together. You, it, it's impossible. We can't do it. And so the implication in this passage is you can't serve both. You can only serve one. Of course, we read a similar thought that G in the Gospels Jesus mentioned about um, that you, you cannot serve God and mammon. So there it's talking about either living your life for God or living your life for mammon, which is like the things of this world, material wealth or other things. You can't, you can't do both. Um, you have to make a choice. Uh, he tells uh, in another uh, parable uh, um, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. You know, you've you got conflict here. It's just not going to work. All right, so we have to choose. And, one, and we see here again on our slide the, the different results. Now, I would encourage us also along these lines to have this thought in our head. Faith in God. Because God's the one that says this is impossible. You could live your life as a Christian and try to embrace both and find out that what God said up front was true, or you can trust him uh, just right up front that this is not going to work. And I would encourage us uh, to trust God that when he says what sin will produce will 
that it's actually true. And uh, partly, I suppose, why I'm uh, thinking those thoughts is that in our culture, there is the thought that if you um, sin, you're going to enjoy it. Um, there's this thought in our culture that to live as a Christian, boring, uh, not fun, giving up on a lot of what life has to offer, it's a lie. That's what God says. It is a lie. It, it brings uh, not only iniquity and unrighteousness, but in the end, it brings death. It is not true. There, there's, there it, you know, it, it, there's some truth as we... Um, read in the scriptures that there can be some pleasure in sin for a season, but the cost is high, the consequences are high, uh, the guilt uh, is often there, and so the end result is not a good thing, and often there's regret from that. Um, let's walk by the Spirit. Let's walk in the light, as First John tells us, that we um, live a life by the power of the Spirit of God, uh, not dominated by sin, well, in closing here, I mentioned I'd come back to the word sanctification, which is kind of that beginning title um, that we had, um, where um, the title of the lesson is How God Sanctifies Us. You know, Jesus prayed for our sanctification in John 17, verse 17. He said this, Sanctify them through thy truth. And so he prayed for Christians, not just the Christians then, but the Christians to follow. He wanted to see them sanctified. Um, Exodus chapter 30, verses 23 through 33, mentions some things that, uh, along the lines of a holy ointment. Uh, you've probably heard of people being anointed with oil in the Old Testament. Uh, perhaps uh, one example, this is an example that came to my mind, uh, King David, when the prophet Samuel was going to anoint the next king of Israel, he went to the house of Jesse, and one by one, as Jesse brought his seven sons before him, God said, nope, not him, no, not him, no, 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 no. They got to him, no, we're, okay, there's no one else left. But Samuel's like, God rejected them all, but Samuel knew that God had sent him to that house to anoint the next king. Eli, don't you have any other sons? And well, yeah, I've got the, the youngest, the little runt that's out tending the sheep. Samuel said, bring him here. And when, uh, when young David was brought uh, before Samuel, God said, that's the man. And he anointed with him with oil. We read a little bit about that in Exodus 30, that idea of anointing with oil. And here's what um, one commentator mentions regarding this. Oil is frequently mentioned in Scripture as an emblem of sanctification and anointing. Um, with, and anointing with it a means of designating objects as well as persons to the service of God. So when David was anointed to be king, it was a way of saying, hey, we're setting you apart for a special service. You're going to be God's next king. And it was a way of designating him that way. Now, we don't often uh, go through the physical act of anointing with oil, but here's the fact that God has called Christians to be sanctified. One verse that mentions this, this is a, a common theme. You see this in a lot of portions of Scripture. So it's not a vague, obscure thought. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2 uh, tells us uh, regarding the church of God, and it specifically is talking to the church of God at Corinth. He says, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. By the way, that's the, what the word saint means means a saint is a called out one in other words one who has been sanctified called out it's not the roman catholic concept of a saint where you've somehow done something extra special so now we give you the title of saint and now maybe we give you a special feast day on the calendar or something like that um, there are those that maybe god uses in special ways but the concept of a saint is what all Christians are, going, are to be. We are to be saints. Uh, he addresses the Corinthian church as saints. Those that are sanctified in Christ, they are called to be saints. That's what they should be. That's their calling. We read also in 1 Thessalonians 3, 4. Uh, sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
verses 3 to 4. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Okay, now what about that sanctification? That ye should abstain or avoid fornication. That's a type of sin. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. How to possess yourself. You're, you're, that's just an old way of saying your body. Possess yourself. Control yourself. Behave yourself. Conduct yourself in sanctification and honor. That's how we should live. And here's another verse in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Uh, Paul says, uh, after reading off a list of sinful behavior, he says to the Corinthian church, and such were some of you. Some of you behaved that way. Some of you did these wicked sins. But you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. That wickedness has been washed. It's washed. It's paid for by the blood of Jesus. Washed in the blood of Jesus. And you are sanctified. You are now set apart. Now you can't be sanctified and holy and embrace sin at the same time. The sin is what we're separated from. It's what we're not to be doing anymore. And so we've been changed. Remember that verse I quoted earlier? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. You are now sanctified and set apart for things to be new, for things to be different. And so that's the end goal of our sanctification. Jude one twenty four says to us that we should present, that, that Jesus, well, Jude is speaking here. Let me read the whole verse. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. That's God. By God's grace, he can keep you from falling. He can keep us from falling into sin. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To present you faultless, to present you as a sanctified person. To keep you from falling into sin and set you apart. And so we're encouraged here in uh, Romans chapter 6 that because of the salvation that was discussed by Paul in the previous chapters that is offered, if we accept that gift of salvation, we're free from sin and we're free to serve God. And it's by God's grace that he helps us to live a sanctified life. If any of us think that it's not a big deal uh, to engage in sinful behavior, let's be encouraged that the consequences there are real and they're bigger than we think. And let's live a life that's sanctified because the, the fruits of this are uh, incredibly wonderful for a Christian. And it's the way we're uh, to live. All right, well, let's go ahead and close our time in a word of prayer and get ready for the morning worship service. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing now on uh, the worship service to follow. May you be honored and pray uh, it's a blessing, uh, no matter how people are connecting with us this morning online or listening on the FM in their cars or sitting outside uh, as a group. We pray that through the preaching of your word, it's a blessing, and we look forward to gathering together soon. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.